in this episode we have an important guest with us and we have with us architect premendra raj mehta let me introduce architect premendra raj mehta to you sir has been a practicing architect and the partner in design action group since 1979 he's also a very active academician and is the visiting professor at the school of planning and architecture new delhi also actively involved in lot of government committees and represented india at wto at geneva but today we are going to talk about something you know that he has been doing very passionately and actively you know he has been serving you know as the voice for the profession of architecture so much so that that he became the president of council of architecture he was nominated to be the president of the council of architecture and he became the voice of the profession substantial work was done by uh, architect mehta when he was the president of council of architecture new delhi so sir at the age of 48 you know when you were the uh, president of council of architecture you know it it's it's a young age to become the president for sure i mean what were your guiding principles uh, first of all raja i must thank you for inviting me for this interview uh, small little correction i was only 42 when i became president not 48 <laughs> Oh, so, oh, 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 pardon me. Uh, so that is, it was not a young age. Uh, I must say that uh, that was the right age uh, to try and implement uh, some ideas uh, which you have, and uh, thereafter you have a chance to correct in case you have made any mistake. And uh, that's the age when you have energy. That's the age when you uh, have reaction to whatever you see around you, and. Uh, you want to bring about change and uh, that's that's the right time absolutely so i feel um, um, i was very lucky that i got an opportunity at that moment council elected me um, as their president and it uh, worked out uh, very well very well so sir you know uh, you once told me about your experience you know when you just joined the president post you know you went to your uh, grandmother so you know she told you something about the guiding principles so sir the viewers you know please tell the viewers about those guiding principles and how they shaped your two terms as the president see it is a very interesting uh, story that uh, when i got elected as the president uh, for the first time uh, my grandmother used to live in mumbai and i had a chance of uh, visiting her almost about a month after i got elected so um, uh, i was very excited to share that uh, news with her and uh, uh, she asked me what is this uh, council all about what do you do so i explained her that uh, this is a regulatory body and uh, it would uh, prepare prescribe uh, the standards of education and then the council has to oversee if the institutions maintain the standards or not and on the practice front similarly we prescribe a code of conduct and then we have to see Uh, that uh, these are observed in the interest of uh, society and um, uh, else there are kinds of uh, provisions that uh, if uh, an architect um, uh, violates that code of conduct he may be punished his license may be sort of, uh, suspended and similarly if an educational institution is not maintaining the standards we can um, go up to be recognizing it or uh, something like that so she understood she she tried to capture exactly what i was saying for almost 45 minutes explaining her the procedures and all that she very seriously she thought about it and then she said okay let me tell you one thing there are three things you should always remember when you hold uh, these kind of positions um, uh, one that i understand uh, that your job is to oversee that things are correct in education in practice so that being a, your uh, spectrum of activity she said remember three things one is that uh, uh, you need to have a judicious eye nyayik drashti unhone kaha ki hamesha rakhna always keep a judicious eye uh, so that uh, uh, because uh, a decision of your council which you decide uh, can actually take away livelihood of a person or it can hurt an institution where you take an adverse decision so you need to be judicious all the time second you she said that us hai ka to sahayak hoga 
implications or what she meant was that the country is so vast. You see, there would be uh, representations from different different parts of the country, be it uh, on educational front or on uh, practice front or on any other aspect which uh, the council is working on, like registration or something. It may be very difficult for people to come and approach you. And uh, so once they send their representation, you will be their representative um, to present their matter before the council in a proper manner so that they, they get justice for whatever they have asked for. And third thing, which was the most important one, in the sense that she said, you have a very small tenure of three years. In these three years, you can't do too much. So always remember, do what would benefit most. So the idea behind that thought was prioritize your work. Always do which would benefit most. Don't spend or devote your time on something which only one person or two person could get benefited. So her idea was that while you are there for three years, try and benefit most of the people with whatever work you do. So these were the three guiding principles she very clearly stated. And I think they became my, my path. Uh, for the next uh, six years or seven years, whatever two ten years I had, and uh, it worked fantastically well to bring back. You see, whatever if there I was in any kind of a uh, trouble or a two minds or looking at something something which was difficult, I would just go back and say, okay, those three principles. If you follow that, I think you would be through, and that is what happened. So your grandmother's talisman, you know, sailed you through, and you did extraordinary amount of good work for Council of Architecture, for the architecture profession and for all the people who were related to it. Now, sir, you know, I also got to know that you produced a lot of guidelines and documents while you were the president. You know, I think probably the most amount of documents were produced when you were the president because they, you know, detailed the scope of the so much work that the council needs to do, know and needs to do because, you know, probably council doesn't know that it has so much power which you probably made them realize. So what about the vision and what was the scope of these papers? See, see first of all, uh, let me tell you that it was not me who did it. It is the council who did it. And it is not the power of the council. It was the responsibility of the council. You see, because the Architects Act had charged the council uh, to, to um, regulate standards of education and the standards of practice apart from, of course, being a registration uh, body. So when you are charged with that kind of a responsibility by the parliament uh, of the country, you ought to be performing. You ought to be setting guidelines. You ought to be uh, setting up regulations as you are empowered to do that and uh, make prescriptions which are practical, implementable, and in the interest of society. So uh, when this process... Uh, uh, is there, uh, then uh, you see, you make uh, these, and the, the aspects are so many. So within education, you see uh, how a five year program, what should be its tenure, what should be the intent of the program, how it needs to be implemented. And then the second responsibility was that, or is that uh, when you prescribe, you need to oversee whether the institutions are maintaining those standards or not. And similar is the case in practice when you prescribe a code of conduct uh, through a regulation, then you have to see what is happening. Now, the matter does not end here. You see, regulations deal with the subject matter. And what uh, Architects Act and has provided for is that when it comes to the subject matter of architecture, uh, the council itself is responsible for doing the detailing. And the idea of making them responsible for doing detailing is that it could be uh, modified, updated with the passage of time, and the contemporary issues are there. Then you don't have to go back to parliament. You, you make a new regulation. And even before you make a regulation, you make a guideline, test it. And uh, once you do that kind of a detailing, um, uh, you see, as far as society is concerned, uh, they would have more responsible professionals. Uh, if they understand their duties, role, responsibilities in this uh, world, uh, they would perform better. So what um, we tried at that time, as a 
collective decision of the council is that let us try and detail out some of the aspects uh, which are left um, for interpretation. Um, let's say uh, when it came to education, we said, okay, let there be a guideline as to who can be admitted uh, to a program in architecture and what should be the process which needs to be followed. So the concept of aptitude test was defined. And the idea was that uh, the universities and uh, respective uh, um, bodies of the states, because education being a concrete subject, um, uh, once the intent is defined, they can prepare a content by themselves. So they would have that kind of autonomy, that kind of freedom, so that in education, we get flavor of um, every region, every thinking uh, coming in. So uh, there was a reasonable amount of flexibility um, uh, or thinking which was allowed uh, by those who are responsible for preparing content like universities and state governments or central government for some of the institutions uh, and uh, at the same time intent must be very clear so our objective was to keep on defining intent and uh, allow others to work around it so this is how council did it, it also did it like what should be the legal liability of a, a architect in practice so um, let there be no confusion. Let there be a clear understanding with other bodies. You see, there is always an overlap. Uh, there is one law and then there is another law. So one law is actually the Architects Act is dealing with the professional part of a person, his conduct or his responsibility. Whereas there are other laws which deal with your uh, consequences of whatever you do in life. So what we thought is that, that if anything is a consequence of his professional practice, any liability which arises out of his, uh, his performance of the, the, the practice of profession, then this needs to be understood first, whether his conduct was appropriate or not before he is charged with any other liability. So we said, okay, the liability of a professional must be well-defined. Similarly, when it came on educational front, there was a big debate at uh, that time during in the early 2000 as to whether a teacher in an educational institution should he be practicing or not. Now, um, when it came to government, uh, when there are no guidelines, government thought that it must be like an engineering um, institution, like IITs, if there is a practice, yes, you can do, but those practices are individual centric. Architectural practice is completely different that you develop an idea, you need assistance, uh, to, to develop your design because the magnitude of the project would be large. Then you need consultants uh, for engineering services to support you and so on. So, and whereas in engineering, you have a wetting of a structural drawing, let's say, or wetting of an electrical engineering scheme or uh, preparing a traffic management plan, which is largely uh, individual centric. So that practice and this practice cannot be compared. But in absence of guidelines, government said, oh, like you do in IIT, do it at a, uh, SPR also, uh, uh, but it, it would not work it, it, at all. So we thought that there should be guidelines for institutional practice, because what um, the council at that time thought that um, a, a teacher doing practice is, is a part of his scheme, is it is he learning and sharing, learning and sharing. And it's like a medical college that if a doctor is uh, not practicing, how would he teach? So same is in architecture, that if you are not practicing, um, uh, how do you understand the intricacies of the subject and the practical part of it? Because this is not a, a theoretical subject. If it finally gets to gets converted into a, a, a physical form and a, a physical element um, in this world which may live beyond your own life. So uh, these um, exercises have to be very responsible exercises and these would be experienced not only by the end user for whom you have designed, but uh, um, for a passerby, it's a visual experience which you are creating. So maybe he's not your client, he has not paid for anything, but uh, he would experience uh, what you do. So this is a very, very responsible profession. And we thought that uh, uh, teachers must engage themselves in, in practice so that a student gets uh, an idea of what a reality the teacher himself sets the benchmark for uh, the quality of architecture which needs to be produced. And uh, uh, when he is uh, declared pass or declared a graduate, 
uh, unlike other profession, he gets into responsible position. This is somebody's lifetime saving is uh, uh, put in his trust that he would design and the money would be spent accordingly. So he, he should not only have a visualization power or originality or creativity uh, in him, but he, he needs to have an interface with the realization part of his uh, conceptualization. So we thought that uh, the, the issue of practice must be addressed, that uh, there is a time which a teacher while in uh, teaching profession, which by itself is a very noble uh, kind of a service he is doing to society, but uh, he must be a professional uh, in true sense. So we thought that we'll prepare a guideline. Now, the idea of preparing a guideline is that it could be tested before it is made a regulation. You see, once you make a regulation, it goes through um, the scrutiny of uh, central government, it goes through uh, the scrutiny of uh, parliament, both the houses of parliament before it is notified in the gadget of India and it becomes law. So uh, what approach uh, I took at that time was that, okay, uh, let us first make guidelines. Let us uh, share it with people. Let people try it out. If uh, there are certain difficulties, let's correct those before we make a regulation. So that is what led to uh, the council make a number of guidelines first. And this is how we did it. We followed a very democratic process. Uh, what we thought that um, everybody should be, uh, opinions should be taken because there are many people who have experience and uh, uh, that experience must benefit uh, the society. So we would prepare a draft, we'll throw it open to all the educational institutions, all the chapters and centers of Indian Institute of Architects, all the architects who are helping council in uh, overseeing maintenance of standards in school, they were practitioners, Many of them are very eminent practitioners. So we get their view. We said, let's send it to all government departments because we have a different perspective uh, altogether. And we, we started gathering their opinion on the first draft. And then once some of the suggestions are incorporated, we'll send it back to them. That, okay, this is what we have done. Do you still have to say something more? So we followed a democratic process, uh, a process which would... Uh, give us insight to uh, the peculiarity of the professions in different different parts and different different practices. And uh, the committee which would be empowered to deal with the subject uh, will keep on working around it and keep on incorporating, keep on sharing. And after four or five rounds of that, then it would come before council. So the idea was that what you have is uh, somewhat practical, somewhat uh, visionary uh, in nature that it can deal with the future issues which are likely to come. It has sufficient flexibilities so that during implementation, uh, some of the uh, newer ideas, if they come, so there should be a possibility of exception at all the time. Because this is one profession where uh, you, you, you tend to get exceptions, you see, uh, because it is, and we wanted to promote excellence in every part. So for excellence, sometimes uh, somebody goes, completely out of the box and you would do something. So we said there should always be a provision for that, that whatever we have proposed, but if somebody has, someone has a, a different way of doing the same thing and achieving maybe something at a better level, uh, we would be open to review it all the time. So that's how number of guidelines were made and uh, were put to the test of time. Thank you. So, so uh, thanks a lot. I mean, so many guidelines were made and they were for the good of the profession. But, you know, there's one issue regarding that AICT. In 2009, in November, uh, there was the Supreme Court judgment, AICT versus Council of Architecture. Now, when we talk about AICT, it's probably a good guideline. It's a good body. It, it does good. It does a good job. But, you know, the G Supreme Court said that AICT will not be regulating architecture, only the Council of Architecture would be regulating architecture. Could you tell us about it and why was it done? Has it benefited us? Please tell us about it. See, one is that it was 2019. So very, very recent uh, judgment just before pandemic uh, came out. This issue cropped up in uh, almost um, uh, year 2000 or maybe even before that. Um, you see, what had happened was that Architects Act came into being in 1972 and it uh, 
charged the council with the responsibility of prescribing standards for architectural education, uh, which uh, and uh, recognized qualifications which would become um, the requirement for your registration with the uh, Council of Architecture. Um, AICT Act came in 1987, so almost 15 years uh, thereafter, it came into being. And in the definition of technical education, it said engineering, architecture, pharmacy, hotel management, management education, and so on. Now, it rest of the things in AICT Act are that approval for initiating a program, again, maintenance of standards, and a few concepts uh, of uh, how to regulate education. So AICT prior to 1987 was a unit of Ministry of Education or Ministry of HRD in whatever form it was. And uh, it was given a statutory status and all the institutions were expected to follow. Now, uh, between 1987 and uh, 1997, uh, when I became president, uh, there was an appreciation in the profession and those uh, at the council that uh, AICT Act being a newer act, uh, the clauses related to architectural education in the 1972 Act is stand repeat automatically. So we have no say in the matter and let AICT deal with it. And AICT and Council of Architecture entered into some kind of an MOU that Council of Architecture will do it on behalf of AICT and so on. So that kind of a position was taken that uh, this act has become redundant, Architects Act, as far as educational uh, scheme is concerned and the subject matter will be dealt with by AICT. When I took over and I started thinking about it, I realized that no, this may not be the right position. You see, we have taken an inferior position by virtue of that, the architectural education started getting diluted. Uh, it became a department and engineering schools. It lost its identity and uh, uh, virtually even most of the new school because of the privatization of uh, education as per policy of uh, 1986, number of schools had come. You see, at that time, there were nearly 110 schools. Uh, of course, now we have uh, maybe nearly 500 schools, 20 years down the line. So we had 100 schools and uh, um, maybe the, all the newer ones were uh, Department of Engineering uh, School. And uh, there were engineers who were heading it because... Uh, the word EICT is All India Council for Technical Education. So they thought this is a technical education, whereas our appreciation at the council was it is not. The technology comes later. First is an idea, conceptualization, art, aesthetics, originality, creativity. You see, our key words were different completely. And uh, this had, act had a complete provision of how to prescribe, how to regulate, who will regulate, uh, how will the process of recognition of qualification or derecognition of qualification will take place? Whereas the ICT Act doesn't talk about anything for any of the uh, subject matters uh, it was deemed. So, and then, you see, we would uh, say that, okay, this institution is uh, not maintaining standards. The ICT would say it is maintaining the standards. If there were conflicts like this, that they would do independent. So, I said, oh, no, we need to challenge this. So you see, that this is not correct. So we approached the central government, explained them that uh, this education is different. Uh, there are all the requisite uh, provisions in the Act of um, uh, 1972. And uh, AICT Act cannot override this because it's a very specialized act. It went to such an extent that the government thought, no, this is not correct. The later act has to prevail. So I decided to go to Attorney General of India. Honorable Soli Sorati was very kind to agree to our request to review. Because what I thought that if the provisions of the Architects Act stand repealed, they are redundant. Why are we getting into it? And if it is not so, why do we let somebody else go into this? You see, if we are responsible, we better discharge our responsibilities. If we are not, let us leave this out. So, so we took that position, we went to the Attorney General of India because Council of Architecture is also a state. So his advice uh, was uh, uh, possible and we could access him. And uh, he gave an opinion that no, as far as architectural education is concerned, it is the Architects Act which will govern 
and AICT would have nothing to do with this. So what if the word architecture is there in the definition of technical education? So it uh, doesn't matter. But uh, neither AICT agreed nor uh, central government agreed uh, to the opinion, though it is expected that uh, opinion of Attorney General is binding on state and we are part of the state. But um, they issued letters, they issued notification in the newspapers, including um, AICT issuing notices in this, that uh, Architects Act stands repealed and uh, we are the only one who will deal with things like that. And it was uh, very embarrassing that the one statutory body is because they had the power of money, maybe, and the backing of uh, central government in that thinking that central government would issue a letter that no architectural education shall be governed by AICT and AICT would give newspaper advertisements. So any institution who does not take our approval uh, will not be a valid educational institution. So there was a big mess between uh, uh, and now uh, in education institutions who are running program in management, engineering, the hotel management, everything, and also architecture. So if they do not take approval of uh, program in architecture, um, their other uh, programs will also get geopartized. So they, they, they came into that kind of a fix. The state governments also got confused that uh, what to do, whom to follow, and so on. And, uh, but some of the standalone institutions, which were only architectural institution, they took up the matter. And one school uh, in Kolapur, Marat, uh, uh, one uh, Prince Shivaji uh, boarding school, uh, they took up the matter uh, straight away to High Court of Mumbai. There was a SAR school in Andhra Pradesh which took the matter to uh, Andhra Pradesh High Court that uh, this is not on. We cannot be troubled by multiple bodies. And our opinion is that we are governed by Architects Act and uh, you decide. So finally, the matter was not between that school and AICT or in school and Council of Architecture. The judge says, Actually, the subject matter is between these two statutory bodies. The institutions are only suffering their, at their hand, and they must uh, come to a, a kind of an understanding that who does what. So they first allowed some time that okay, both the bodies should talk to each other and so on. But naturally, I had taken a position that I want absolute clarity. I told counsel that let us have absolute clarity. If we are responsible, we'll be doing the job. If we are not, as per law, we should get out of this. Andhra Pradesh High Court said no, it is to be regulated under Architects Act. Mumbai High Court in 2004 gave a very clear uh, judgment and a very detailed judgment that the Architects Act is a comprehensive act, it is a specialized act, and AICT Act uh, cannot come in their way in discharge of their obligation as far as prescribing minimum standards are concerned maintenance of minimum standards are concerned because it leads to recognition of qualification and de-recognition of qualification. So once the Mumbai High Court judgment was there, there was a big issue in the government and at AICT. So they engaged the best of the lawyers and they went to Supreme Court. The SLP was filed that this is not on and they sought stay on this order of Mumbai High Court because they thought that if that would prevail, um, the, all the institutions would naturally not come under uh, their control whatsoever. But uh, Supreme Court at the first hearing itself said that this is an unimpeachable order of Mumbai High Court. We are not inclined to grant you stay. So AICT did not get a stay on that order of the judgment of the Mumbai High Court and subject matter came in Supreme Court. That was 2004 something like that. And then it took 15 more years at Supreme Court that what should happen. So every time there would be uh, subject matter would be heard. Um, Supreme Court would also uh, desire that, okay, these are two statutory bodies. Why are you fighting amongst yourself? Take a call. They would ask uh, Attorney General or Solicitor General that please think about it. Get the matter settled. It is not good. And we at least get Council of Architecture, everybody appreciated. Uh, naturally, my tenure was also over uh, by then. Uh, but uh, finally, the matter came up for hearing. 
and uh, Supreme Court uh, not only decided that matter that uh, who would regulate, you know, it is the Architects Act under the provisions of that, the education would be um, regulated. But they also said that the whole problem is the reason because the word architecture has appeared in the definition of technical education. So they said, let this be deleted. So they went and made a, went ahead and made a correction in the AICT Act. The word architecture was deleted. And uh, since then, uh, this clarity has come. Uh, but of course, uh, in terms of implementation, 2004 onwards, it, it, there's an absolute clarity. But what had happened that the position which council took between 1987 and 1997, or uh, say up to 2000, actually uh, that brought about that mess. You see, uh, it, it is at the first day when the ICT had, the act had come, it should have been tested, it should have been decided. Uh, you couldn't have confused the institution that like whether it is a technical education, whether it is a part of engineering education and so on. So during my tenure, it took a lot of our energy to restore that uh, dignity, autonomy of the architectural institution wherever they existed. Even with the IITs, um, I had an issue and then we had to resolve it. IIT Kharagpur decided that out of five-year program, the first year, of a BR's program would be common with engineering program. It will be identical to civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. The first year will be common because in IIT, for all engineering, the first year is common. So I said, no, cannot do it. It took me time. It took me a lot of effort at that time. The council had to work on it repeatedly. And uh, IIT Kharagpur had to agree that Architects Act would prevail. So what if IIT itself is a statutory body and it's an institution of national importance. But when it comes to education of architecture, the, the provisions of the Architects Act would prevail over any, any other aspect. So they had to revert to the full-fledged five-year program. So that happened. So but since there was so much of confusion because of the inferior position taken by the council in those uh, 10 years, uh, we had uh, so much of problems. So a lot of energy was uh, uh, had to be applied, had to be devoted um, to get uh, the position uh, of an institution back. You see, the, for us, uh, what was important uh, was that the peculiarity of the education of architecture should not get affected by any other thinking, and because this is one education which is contemporary in nature, unlike other. Um, syllabi of other subjects. Uh, you see, uh, intent is prescribed by council, content is prepared by university, and the classroom problem is prepared by my institute director. You see, the intent says that you must understand the implication of climate on design. The, the content says you will study climatology and uh, all aspects of uh, climatology, that how the sun moves, how sun affects, how rain takes place, all that. Um, so content is prepared and the studio director says, uh, let us have a building uh, to be designed in a hilly area. And then he tests that whether those ideas uh, could be translated into design or not. And he chooses a very contemporary kind of a scheme dovetailed with uh, the newer thoughts and newer statutory requirements, uh, like the building needs to be accessory. So you say you have a region specific building, but it must be accessory. So, so this is a unique program where a design problem is a very contemporary. It reflects the aspiration of society of a time. Uh, it, it reflects the development of uh, science and technology of a time. It reflects a thinking of a value system of a society of a time. And so this is a, a unique education and unique kind of a scheme of syllabus, uh, which uh, um, when implemented, uh, it, it makes a professional absolutely ready to deal with his contemporary problems uh, which are around uh, society. So we thought that that must be in place. That scheme cannot change. And if it gets uh, regulated uh, by a different scheme altogether, um, then it would lose its, uh, its character, it lose its identity, it lose its peculiarity. And uh, the society would be at the loss uh, at the end of 
so that was that so sir you you saved the profession you saved the architectural education but you were also savior for many architects you know my next question you were a savior for architects uh, who were in litigation for providing architectural services and you know you saved them and you brought them out of courts and you said that council will be the uh, judicial body who's going to judge whether the service was proper or not so how did the architects act come to the rescue of these architects and what was the role the council played sir so i will not say that architects act had come to their rescue you see it's a question of uh, uh, judicious approach that uh, when somebody's uh, building uh, collapse um you see many people are not aware that there is something called architects act and they would feel that it is his negligence which has caused the damage or hurt to a person and things like that and it is very easy when an accident of that kind takes place uh, for a contractor to say that uh, i designed it exactly as uh, i was asked to or i implemented it exactly the, the design was given to me the owner says that i don't understand this subject it is either an architect or the contractor what they have done i do not know so this is a very specialized subject i don't understand so naturally the first point is an architect that he gets hit that he is the originator of the design so if anything has gone wrong maybe he is responsible the view of the council at that point was that uh, you can't charge him with uh, a, a, a kind of a negligence unless you have examined so it was a judicious process only which we thought must be pursued that the first and foremost is that it must be established that there has been a mistake on the part of an architect that uh, whether it is uh, is uh, deficiency in design or deficiency in service because all that is also defined in the documents uh, prepared by council of architecture as one guidelines so uh, what uh, whenever we were called upon by the courts to put forth a position or a advice was sought by some of the lawyers we we told them that you see unless he is proved guilty in the court the council is also a quasi judicial uh, body that if there is a professional misconduct there is a complete procedure uh, to understand as to uh, whether or not he has made a mistake or not so similar to a civil court the information can be called for uh, he is given an opportunity to be heard and so on identical to 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 courts so our point of view and advice to architects was that unless you are proved guilty here of the professional action you have taken we are not discussing anything else other than that here in this forum but uh, somebody cannot say that so and so is has been negligent or deficient uh, his services were deficient and so on because this is the only forum and under the provisions of the architects act that is the body which will decide whether because this is the kind of uh, responsibility parliament has given to this body that you are a specialized body you are composed of architects so you would do this you will uh, decide whether a person has uh, been providing deficient service or he has uh, been negligent so once that is done then the law will take its own course you see whatever are the consequences of that uh, because council restricts itself uh, to the remedial part of it only uh, in the sense that uh, the conduct is is regulated but uh, the consequences of that of his conduct or infamous conduct if there are any then the law of land would um, decide what is what are the penalties he has to face or how the correction so the council's attitude is correctional in nature and um, the damage done or the remedy which you need, you need to work around the other laws then so somebody who has suffered at his hand can take those recourses so what that means is that the first screening whether an architect has done any professional misconduct or not has to absolutely first go to council of architecture and then later the law would take its course whether it becomes a civil or a criminal action and then but yeah, the first problem. point of contact is always the council of architecture to it's, check whether there is professional misconduct or not so absolutely. thank you thank you thank you so you know sir uh, talking about uh, uh, courts and judgments you know there was this recent supreme court judgment you know where the the supreme court honorable supreme court has said that 
that there is no exclusivity on the practice of architecture you know what is your we all seen and heard about that judgment what is your suggestion for the present council should the council get up and follow up with the supreme court follow up with the government to get the architects act amended what is your view on this see architects act uh, can be amended only by the parliament you see parliament enacted that act and it has power so uh, you see when the question of interpretation of act has come supreme court's uh, opinion is final you see so they have observed that the provisions uh, of this act are such that uh, the there is no exclusive right to practice the profession of an architect by an architect the definition of architect is already provided for that uh, in the architects act that he would have qualification he would be resident of india and so on so all the prescriptions are there that who can be called an architect but they are saying uh, the practice of an architect is not restricted to an architect so uh, of course it, it, that's the judgment which has come so the remedy lies uh, with uh, only parliament and i think uh, council needs to approach i'm sure they must be doing it um, we have a very good uh, uh, knowledgeable and uh, sensitive president at this moment in uh, professor habib khan and i'm sure um, uh, this subject matter would be taken up uh, with the central government so that uh, appropriate amendment can be moved because the whole idea behind uh, uh, this um, kind of uh, what you call exclusivity i said uh, the right professional must be doing right job for the society so if society has invested Uh, in educating um, its human resource for a particular uh, practice of a profession be it medicine law architecture that uh, it is the investment made by society in the human resource um, with an objective that they be served um, by a knowledgeable person so that's the importance of a particular education because that's the aspiration of society that i be served by Uh, one who knows uh, the subject so that is uh, the concept so um, there has to be reasonable restriction on practice of uh, any profession for that matter and uh, this is one profession which is very very old well understood by society and uh, not only in india but uh, world over all developing nations we have building in our country which are designed by architects uh, almost uh, Uh, 200 years ago uh, we we have had buildings the drawings were prepared and those buildings particularly the institutional buildings uh, british architects came here designed and whatever buildings we take pride in uh, today even when we talking of the capital complex and to this that today we are debating on that they were all designed over 120 years ago by professional architects so uh, how can you, you say that now after so many years of seeing uh, the contribution made by uh, trained architects and uh, educated architects now you say that now it can be practiced by anybody else so uh, but anyway uh, there is an issue uh, with the law which uh, has been made so some kind of amendment and which is a very usual way you see government also uh, the parliament also makes laws and then makes amendment even in our constitution we, we keep on making amendments so because uh, it has to serve a particular time so it has to respond to that requirement of a particular time so if there is a lacuna there is a, a something which was actually intended by parliament but somehow uh, the supreme court after 50 years of acting there feels that this is not there then some amendments have to be brought in then council can initiate uh, but uh, uh, the responsibility lies with parliament you see finally because they have to think that what is because through these acts they they express the will of the people wish of the people so that, that, that issue is uh, the issue uh, to be dealt with by parliament uh, we can only bring about um, what is our appreciation of the situation before the law makers absolutely so sir uh, thank you for that answer and i hope the current council under the learned uh, leadership of uh, professor habib khan you know take some action and make sure that the parliament is pushed and nudged to make some amendments so that 
the exclusivity of the profession is retained so you know you earlier spoke about judicious view you also spoke about that you know there is the professional misconduct has to be judged by the council of architecture so so when you were the uh, president you know there were a lot of complaints again architects probably what was your yardstick for holding them to account did you show some leniency because at the end they are fellow professionals you know please tell us no, about no, no, no. that no, no, no. as i said it is a quasi judicial body okay you are just you see your the, the the responsibility council has to protect the interest of society okay. not protect the interest of a particular person they you see you are like judges you see judges are also at one time they were advocates so so if there is a complaint against an advocate the judge would not take a view which is lenient you see he would go as per law so okay. when you in the seat of a judge in the council um, is a judge at, at some point of time in such cases uh, they have to uh, be doing justice uh, to to uh, what is before them so if there is a complaint against somebody and somebody has done wrong the question of leniency does not arise it is the law which will prevail and that is how it would happen and it is not only might you know you see any time uh, the council uh, any council any for that matter any quasi judicial body uh, they have to deal uh, with the subject matter with the, the yardstick of law the requirement of law because the whole idea you see uh, the meaning of um, practice of law is to have a just society it is not winning a case for a client or things like that that ultimately what we want is a just society so um, you have to be judicious when when you are taking that kind of uh, before you and the procedure is laid down completely there are checks and balances Absolutely. that that uh, disciplinary committee reviews the matter and then it is placed for acceptance before the full house of the council so um, the whole idea is that uh, uh, nobody who has not done anything wrong be ever punished so there is an opportunity to be heard at the disciplinary committee level there is an opportunity to be heard before the bar of the council and so on so that works um, and that brings about uh, reasonability in the whole process absolutely 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 so sir you know um, you also spoke about that uh, the aict decision you know uh, you actually the council went against what the center wanted so you know when you were the president probably there were many times when the executive that is the you know the government told you certain things but you know those were probably not in line with what the council should be doing so how does one deal with the pressure from the executive when one is in a independent statutory position sir see the whole concept of creating a autonomous statutory body if i look at the bill of the parliament is that they must have an independent mind uh they must uh, they must be subject to specialist all of them and uh, naturally uh, you are given that responsibility by a parliament to deal with that subject matter in the fittest manner and in a befitting uh, decorum of um, uh, whatever you do because uh, uh, you are one of the arms of the state so you are one state like ugc is one which is regulating higher education eict is another one council of architecture is another one and uh, medical council is another one so they all need to coexist because they have been given specific responsibilities there may be some overlap also when it comes to grant maybe the ugc has to give grant and the council of architecture can interfere in that so you have to draw your own lines but my my job is to only oversee the standards and say yes or no and inform the state or the university that is the status of this institution so uh, autonomous bodies are charged with uh, these kind of responsibilities and uh, based on their opinion uh, central government uh, takes action like if i a council of architecture says that uh, somebody is not maintaining the standards now consistently for four or five years and uh, they don't deserve to be recognized anymore so you make your recommendation your recommendation is very valuable because it is backed up Uh, by a study or a review over a period of time but central government in its own wisdom um, has to take a decision whether to be recognize what happens to the students which are there already in the pipeline and so on or they may decide to give them more opportunities to remedy the deficiency and so on so these are checks and balances 
but you remain a very specialized body or advisory body uh, to 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 government so that's your relationship uh, with them your um, annual report uh, uh, is placed before both uh, the parliament so you are accountable uh, to the actions you take so when you have this situation uh, of this um, a, a very uh, meaningful relationship between the executive and the autonomous bodies um, sometimes you have difference of opinion and this difference of opinion could be professional in nature it could be legal in nature like when i say that uh, if council feels that uh, this institution is not maintaining the standards you see uh, you can't have anything else outside the uh, the charter which you have and you feel that the students who are being trained uh, justice is not being done to them that is step number 1 and thereafter if they become professionals and they are recognized they are registered the society would suffer at their hands so there are two issues that one who has paid for one who has aspired to become an architect you are not doing justice with him and second is you are letting the society suffer so supposing the government says no no let it continue because university is empowered to grant it you see the, the in during my tenure and even today this situation comes united states says i am also a autonomous body i am also a statutory body i am empowered to grant a degree who are you to tell me that this degree would be recognized or not recognized because once i have awarded a degree he has a lifelong degree he gets the title b arch with him you cannot take it away true council of architecture cannot take it away but council of architecture can say that this qualification is not recognizable but central government has to say yes to that so th these are the checks and balances so we advise the university the council under the provisions of that would advise the university that the standards are not being maintained by the institution which is affiliated by you or which is your constituent college please do something about it and these are the specific deficiencies improve upon it show us the improvement we will review it again or if we have made any mistake please let us know you see that is the kind of transparency which exists in the system itself because a report of inspector has to go back to the university and institution do you agree with us do you have a difference of opinion tell us so at every stage these are checks and balances and thereafter supposing all this you do properly but you still have a difference of opinion you have difference of opinion fine resolve it resolve it by dialogue Absolutely. Resolve it by that cannot happen. Then maybe it's the court. So somebody would have to do that. Absolutely. But you be taking a position that just because somebody says this is right and that is wrong, that cannot be the position. You have to apply your own mind. You have to look at your own responsibility. And good thing is, then most of these uh, autonomous body leave AICT and UGC. Um, the um, members are honorary. President is honorary. so his stakes are only profession and that is what happened with me that my stake was only my profession my Absolutely. education i have no other pressure of any kind that somebody would remove me from the job or my salary would not come no no such fear so the autonomy uh, in true sense uh, has to be exercised but with responsibility absolutely absolutely it cannot be without a purpose it is you have a sense of purpose in you and you have a responsibility and good part is that the council of architecture is largely composed by representatives of the state government and central government absolutely absolutely so your your 75% of the members are from the government so uh, you have the checks and balance within the council also absolutely so so thank you sir for that answer you know probably it's a guideline for a lot of people who are in government Uh, public positions and you know sometimes a lot of this pressure comes and goes so thank you for that answer so you know there's also a thing called conflict of interest so you know a person in public office there is a scope of conflict of interest how does one manage any issues of personal gain because you know there's an influence that person has as a as a public office bearer so how does one deal with all those things around conflict and interest and personal gain sir <laughs> see i do not know but you see it is a question of ethics you see and uh, ethics are uh, not only written these are self governed self defined and self governed 
So you have to decide that you don't do not misuse a position for your own benefit. So um, it is uh, it is how society understands it, and how it gets ingrained in every member of the society. Uh, it works uh, with that. So um, uh, we have to leave it to individuals that uh, they have to draw their lines. They have to set examples for people who are around them. Uh, and uh, restrain themselves. Uh, you see, there may be uh, sometimes a situation where uh, you feel, okay, if I do this myself, maybe I'm benefited. But um, you should always remember what, uh, why you are there in the public office, what are your responsibilities, and uh, you are setting a trend. So anything and everything you do is, uh, is a public scrutiny of that not only scrutiny by your colleagues, but there's a public scrutiny. And uh, any action which uh, is any way short of uh, that responsibility you are charged with, it can dent your image, image of an institution, not only of an individual. So one has to be very careful. And um, the scheme of things, are, bottom line is only ethics. So uh, you observe certain ethics when you are in public office and uh, once you demonstrate it uh, and you maintain good standards, those who would lead an institution, the others would uh, emulate that. So that's a responsibility uh, with the, those who are assigned uh, leadership uh, in, in different uh, public offices. So in their own way, they have to demonstrate that uh, what is the requirement of uh, ethical conduct, uh, whether written, not written, uh, because this is also very dynamic. Society is a very dynamic uh, scheme of things. So things keep on changing. So what is considered as right, you should be only doing it. But what is considered not right, don't touch it. So, thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For, yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Uh, you know, important point about ethics. You know, which is very important at a lot of times for all of us to follow. So, you know, I also want to ask you, you know, right, there are a lot of online forums of architecture in India, architecture education forums on a lot of uh, social media uh, platforms. There is a certain, you know, that a, a certain smell or a certain air of negativity around that profession is bad. Architects, architects don't get paid this, that profession, you know, is falling something. All these conversations exist. So, sir, how does one deal with such negativity, if I must say, which is apparent on social media? And is it is it true? Tell us about it. See, uh, having positive uh, feeling and negative feeling is all part of life. You see, uh, you have situations where you feel, oh, nothing in this world is with you. But at second moment, um, you get uh, appreciation of what uh, you have contributed, uh, particularly, let's say, in architecture. You've designed a building and you... you you get appreciation for from your client or some users or somebody who visits, and the mood changes. So uh, in what mood you are and uh, how you are being uh, looked at, uh, you see, you tend to uh, respond, react like that. And it's, it's, it's very human to, to respond to whatever is happening around you. So uh, that apart, but I think uh, this profession uh, has so much of charm for those who are practicing it, because everything is new, everything is a creative response, everything is, a, every time it's a new idea, new client, new human being, new situation. So um, if you wish to enjoy it, uh, you can enjoy it thoroughly. See, you meet people, you see, you're so fortunate, you see the complete cross-section of society, economic and social poor, poorest of poor person, is a, a doing labor at your site. And uh, the one who is very well organized, financially well off, uh, has a, a, a very comfortable life, he, he's your client. Absolutely. So uh, you see the complete cross section that those who are intelligent people, they are your clients. They're very brilliant. Then you have very hardworking people who are working at your site. So you see them. You see them from different parts of the country. Uh, that uh, somebody plumber comes from Visa, the, the fabricator comes from Kerala, the labor comes from Bihar. 
you, you see, you, you, you tend to get an exposure of uh, what is happening in your country at a societal level or economic level. So, and that tempers you, that tempers you, that makes you understand what life is. So this is a great profession which gives you that opportunity to understand the futuristic thinking, but then you also meet a person who's only worried about today. He's not able to think about tomorrow. So you see these uh, dichotomies, um, first an experience you have. So um, uh, there can be, in my personal experience, there can be no time in life where you are not learning. So you are learning every day. You, you visualize something and uh, the realization takes place. It's, it's a great uh, feeling that I visualize this and this has happened exactly the way I want it. So you are able to create something, so it gives you joy. So it is how you look at it, uh, this opportunity and being in this profession. But uh, to me, it, it, it's a great profession to be in and uh, it, it teaches you how to learn. So when you, any career you choose thereafter, after being educated as an architect or being in practice for some time, you're, you're trained to analyze the situation from multiple angles and you assimilate all the information which comes in, you prioritize it properly because you're trained to prioritize it. You can create options for uh, this situation, which may be equally good. And then you are trained to choose also. That, okay, you have five options, choose one. So it's a great uh, thing to be in this profession. Enjoy it. This is what I will say. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, sir, for you know setting that positive tone and uh, you know telling us all that it's a holistic education and uh, it is going to train you for whatever you're going to do in life. So you you know we've covered a lot today. We've covered. Uh, about AICT, COA, your guiding principles. Thank you so much for sharing them. We've covered about how exclusivity, uh, the judgment of Supreme Court uh, was, uh, you know, declared. So many things about how to be the, the president and, you know, how to be in that position and do good. You've spoken a lot today. Now, so my final request to you, if I could tell you and request you, is that could you give a message to, one, the Council of Architecture, to all the architects, you know, as to uh, how can they take the profession way ahead in the future for the good of all? See, first of all, I cannot have an advice for council. I may be advised by council. If I need to do something for them, I would do that. You see, that's a statutory body. So I would leave that part of, of the question. But um, the second part of your uh, question, uh, concerning the professionals is that enjoy your profession thoroughly. Keep contributing. Keep generating new ideas. Because you see, you can bring joy to society you see, by your creativity. So keep doing that. And keep the flag flying high of the profession by creating good architecture. So good architecture is the only requirement. Uh, because it's a physical form, you would witness it. So with the landscape, if you see architecture, and if they, they are close to each other, they merge, they, they respond to each other. We have done our duty. So we would do that. So we, we need to focus um, on the creation of good architecture, wherever we are and whichever way we are doing, maybe a small project like an interior or a small building or a big building create something good so that it inspires people and they feel happy about your contribution. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, very insightful. I'm personally grateful for, you know, sharing such an insightful journey of yours when you were the council president. And, you know, for all the viewers, you know, there's a bio of sir in the description. He's done a lot of work in a very diverse areas. And, you know, you'll be really, really inspired to read his bio, which is right in the description again. So, uh, so thank you so much, sir, for sharing your life and your uh, important term uh, during the presidentship of Council of Architecture and how you took so such important decisions which are impacting everybody today, including big architectural institutions to every single architect. So thank you on the behalf of all architects, first of all, uh, for you know taking such a stand. And I wish this spirit is kept alive in all the architects and we all keep doing good, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Raja. Thanks.